my friends in Christ, suddenly the, the, the altar colors, the altar banner is red. We've been looking at white for seven weeks, the white of Easter, and today it's red. You know why the color goes red? Well, on Pentecost Day, that, that, that something that looked like fire, which burst out around the apostles, the twelve. And later on, just a chapter or two ahead of us, the red is blood um, for the blood of those who um, stand up in a world uh, where the devil is the, the master, according to Jesus, the prince of the world. So suddenly red. It'll just be red for one week. I got a question for you. When, when we speak the Apostles' Creed, we usually do that in most of our worship services, you know that it has three parts. The Apostles' Creed is the short little creed. Creed means I believe. And it's a statement of what a Christian would have to believe in order to be a Christian. It's, it's, it's pretty short. The first, there, there are three parts to it, a part about the Father and his work, a part about the Son and his work, and a part about the Holy Spirit and his work. Now, you know that there's not much, not many words spent on the Father. It's just one sentence. There is a God. He can do anything. Everything I have comes from him. One sentence. But then you come to a fork in the road. And you come to the section about God's son, Jesus. And there are 11 sentences. The 11 verbs, not just one like in the first article, maker. Um, you got all these verbs, all these action words. Conceived, born, suffered, crucified, died, buried descended, rose, ascended, sits at God's right hand and will return to judge. So you can see that many people are willing to say the first part of the creed. They would say, I believe that there's a God behind life and love and loss and death. I believe that there's somebody out there, he, she, they, who knows. But when you get to the second part of the creed, as I said, you come to a fork in the road. And here you leave behind uh, anybody who says, no, I don't want that Jesus stuff. I don't want that Son of God stuff. Uh, here the road forks off and takes a very strong statement about God's Son. And we have just come through the Good Friday and Easter and the Ascension. All that stuff makes it into the creed, doesn't it? Here's my question for you. When you get to the third part of the creed, the part about the Holy Spirit, do, do you start to lose your attention? I, I'm speaking from experience here. Uh, when you get to that third part of the creed, does it all seem a little catechism-ish or a little doctrinal and not warm? like conceived, born, suffered, where you can see these things because you've heard these Bible episodes so many times and there's a person at the center of it. When you get to the third article of the creed, maybe it's that word article that just sounds so bookish. We don't have a narrative to go with it. You know, if you want to have a picture of the Holy Spirit, you got to work kind of hard because he's a spirit. He doesn't have a body. And so you're sort of stuck with two choices. One would be the dove. Uh, I don't know how warm you can feel toward a bird. Uh, one would be the dove the, at Jesus' baptism. And the other is fire from Acts chapter 2. I guess our goal here today, wow, this chapter, uh, you could spend all summer on it, I think, and not be bored and feel like you were 
you got a good filling meal every time we gathered to talk about it. It's kind of a challenge to s slice it up and just lift out uh, one or two little things. I'll see if I can help. Um, let this be the narrative for the third part of the creed when we say it after a while. Um, all kinds of stuff's going to come flying at you here because this is there. There's so much happening. Uh, seven weeks after Easter, you have a festival. It is a national festival. I, it, it's like Thanksgiving. It what? What's w weird for us is that their seasons are different from ours. They they have a harvest in spring. Yeah, like we have a harvest in fall. So Pentecost was a thing before Jesus ever was born. It was one of the three big national festivals that required you to can't call off work and to travel to Jerusalem, one of the three pilgrim or travel festivals that uh, everybody had to go to. If you didn't want to participate, you made, you're making the decision, Moses said, that you're not part of the people. So these were big. Pentecost involved bringing the first cut of your crop, whether that was grapes or olives or wheat or lambs. Um, the first fruits, the first fruits came to God's house. And there they would go to God's servants who worked in the temple because they didn't have a job that gave them a paycheck. So as the people were prospered, so the priests and the Levites prospered. Okay, so Pentecost, everybody knows about it. It's a harvest festival, first fruits, first cut. Do you remember from last week uh, we heard that Jesus told his little huddle of believers, remember how many there were? 120, that's all. So maybe a third the size or a quarter the size of Gethsemane congregation. That's all the Christians there were, 120. We feel like saying, Jesus, couldn't you do a little better than that? That's all he had when he ascended, one, two, zero. And then, if that isn't bad enough, then he's got fools and sinners for leaders, right? If you know the story. Not very encouraging. Doesn't build up a lot of confidence that he leaves these 12. And then for the 12th one to replace Judas, they have to roll dice um, to fill that vacant spot. And then Jesus ascends. And... As they're watching him go, two angels appear, as there were two angels at the grave. Remember that on Easter when they said, why do you look for the living among the dead? Well, this time they said, why are you staring up into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven to be at his Father's right hand, the position of all authority and all power, this same Jesus will come back in the same way you've seen him go. So, uh, 10 days later is Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, there are all these travelers, all these, you know, we talked about it concerning Passover uh, back in Lent. Um, it's estimated that this walled city of Jerusalem where Mount Zion was a uh, uh, a plateau, a pediment up in the northeast corner and a, and a wall around the city. It's estimated there were half a million people squashed into that. Think of a tuna can. That's how Jerusalem was, packed full of people. So on, when the day of Pentecost came, we read it before, without warning, there was the sound of a violent wind. Now we call a violent wind a tornado We've seen all seen pictures of the palm trees down in New Orleans, a hurricane. The sound of a violent wind. There wasn't plywood flying around in the air. 
sound of a violent wind. So a wind, but powerful, but no destruction. When people heard that, all these pilgrims who were in Jerusalem, they started moving toward the neighborhood where this sound was being generated. They weren't afraid because there was not, you know, as I said, no sheet metal, pieces of sheet metal um, skipping down the street, no electric lines down. They started heading for this neighborhood. And then when they got there, where the sound seemed to be originating, here are the 12 apostles of Jesus. And it looks like fire has burst out around them. But it, it wasn't a stop, drop, and roll kind of a fire. Nothing was, no hair was burning. And so the, their attention, all these, all these visitors to Jerusalem from many different countries, you heard the names before, how far people traveled, what it must have cost them, how much time it took in, in, a, in a day when there was no air, airfare or driving 70 miles an hour. They saw the apostles, and when they came near them to see this strange thing, they heard them speaking, and every visitor from the dozen or 15 or however many countries we read about, they heard them speaking in the, the, the visitors, the, the, the pilgrim worshipers, they heard them speaking their own languages. And not just... Um, you know, like reciting lists of foreign words, but it says, we hear them declaring the wonderful works of God. Well, what are, what are the wonderful works of God? We, we say it in the creed. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried on the third day, he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven. So they hear the message of what we call the creed, spoken in their own languages. And they say, aren't all these guys who are speaking rural, aren't they hillbillies up from Galilee? Galilee had a, a bad reputation for being behind everybody else, especially as compared to the urban, sophisticated Jerusalem. Aren't all these men who are speaking Galileans and so they were bewildered. That's when Peter stood up and said, oh, 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 this is what Jesus was talking about. When he said, stay in Jerusalem until you receive a gift. That'll enable you to go ye therefore and teach all nations. And then Peter, he quotes from memory, his catechism passage. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. And then he mentions young and old, male and female, boys and girls, of every tribe, nation, language, and people. I will pour out my Holy Spirit. So here is the, the narrative to go with the third article of the creed. I'm going to run you through this. Um, I know you know this. You've said it so many times. Maybe some of you are like me. When you know something, your brain shuts off about uh, six words into it because you have muscle memory and you can say the creed without thinking of it. Um, I'll never forget a dear old Christian woman who said to me one time, Pastor, I don't like saying the Lord's Prayer in, in updated language in everyday American English because I don't have to think when I say it the other way. I, I think, do you, hear what do you hear what just came out of your mouth? You don't have to think. Um, so here's the, here's the way the Apostles' Creed ends, and I want to see if you agree with me that you usually, usually you lose your train of thought by the time you get here because you don't have the narrative. You don't have the story of Jesus' life. I believe that there's a Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Christian Church. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. 
the resurrection of the body, of the dead body, and life everlasting. Now, I think most kids would say that's the most boring part of the creed. But if you think of why that was written, the way it was written, uh, maybe we can appreciate it and put a little zip into our, into our personal worship next time we run across those words. Think of, if you didn't have the third article, the Holy Spirit part of the creed, what would you be missing? Well, I, th I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe that there is a Holy Spirit um, we all know there's an evil spirit in the world. I mean, you don't have to work very hard at that, right? Just turn the TV on and watch some news or um, talk to your family members. Drug addictions, um, inflation, wiping out savings, um, car, accident, uh, politicians from whatever party making promises to get elected and then um, whichever party, doesn't matter, not keeping those promises when they get into office. Um, pornography, which cuts across every sector of society. Um, loss of respect for Christian marriage. You know, we all know there's an evil spirit in the world. But what, what people don't expect or believe by nature is that God's Holy Spirit is at work in the world. God has sent Jesus on Pentecost Day um, at his father's right hand, pours out from his position of all power and authority, pours out God's spirit. Where, just randomly? No, onto his church, capital C. Church always means people. It doesn't mean bricks and carpet and wood and glass. Not in the Bible, it doesn't. It always means people. Church, capital C, are the boys and girls, men and women, who have learned to say, I am sinful from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, however. I've also heard about a savior whose name is Jesus of Nazareth, who came here to take what is mine and to give me what is his. So I believe that God kept his promise in the Garden of Eden when he said to Satan, I'm going to have a family despite what you did. Church is the family of God. I'm gathering a family, Satan, despite you. So the Holy Christian Church sometimes called the community of saints. In this church, in this family of God, there is a treasure. What is it? Forgiveness for my sin. That forgiveness doesn't exist anywhere else. Only God's church has it. From the littlest, newest baptized baby to the oldest elderly in the Alzheimer's residential community, Christians have this. It's been given to us by Jesus. We celebrate it, we repeat it, we share it. The forgiveness of sins. You could say it like this. I, sometimes I think if I really understood it, I would say it like this. The forgiveness of sins. It's not really the forgiveness of sins. I mean, what else is there to forgive? It's, I believe that there's forgiveness for sins. Those who know their sins are on Jesus and his righteousness is on us, and then we're not so scared of dead bodies anymore. That's the next line. I believe in the resurrection of the dead body. I believe that Jesus meant it when he said, if I live, you also will live. 
And I believe that there's not just a temporary life every time you drive through an intersection and you see some ribbons and a little cross and a, a stuffed doll duct taped to the bottom of a stop sign and some candles and some sparkly stuff. What do you say? Oh, some teenager uh, made a left turn across traffic here. Life is short, life is temporary, it doesn't take much to knock one of us out. Does it a germ, slip on the ice, a moment's inattention in the car? So we're all familiar with life being temporary. This is the way, this is our experience, it's our strongest experience. But the creed says, oh, no, 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 there's a life after this one. So if you were saying the creed along those lines, you would say something like this. Um, Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father and he will return to judge the living and the dead. And I believe that God's spirit is at work in the world. On Pentecost Day, auditory and visual. We got the same thing, right? We're doing auditory right here. When you receive communion or we have a baptism, then you get that visual element mixed in. The Holy Spirit uses media. In Latin, we say the media of grace. In English, we lose something. We say the means of grace. It doesn't communicate very well. The media of grace, um, word and Sacrament, three places where the Holy Spirit says, you can find me here, like a bus stop. I believe that there's a, God's Holy Spirit is at work in the world, and that he's gathering a family. It's called the Holy Christian Church. It's a church, it's a community of people. It's holy, it's set apart, it's Christian, my my goodness, my merit is not in me, but it's from an alien source, from outside of me, it is in Christ, Holy Christian Church. I believe that there's such a thing, no matter what anybody else says. In this church is a treasure. Forgiveness of sins. We who spend all our lives fearing the loss of our strength and our mind and our bodies and our life, we get to say in the creed, I believe that there'll be a resurrection from the dead. And that the, the day of my burial or the day of my uh, being incinerated back to dust, whether I go back to dust in, in an hour or I go back in 20 years, it doesn't matter because Christ says, if I live, you also will live. So in the creed, we're kind of winding up here on a high note, not a low note. It's kind of like a flyover with jets at an NFL game. This is how the creed ends. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I believe in the resurrection of the dead body. And I believe in a life everlasting, not just temporary, not just three months or 13 years or 57 years, or even, I met someone last week, 106. Um, even 106 years, what is it, finally? It's temporary. Those dates on your gravestone, those are pretty really carved in there, right? One of mine is in there already. The other one will come on there, and then those are my dates. Uh, when you're a Christian, you can say, no, 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 no. Last line of the creed, I believe in life everlasting. So, here's a little quote. A person has not come to know Christ fully until she has come to know also the church, which the ascended Christ creates by his word, through his messengers. Why does Pentecost matter? Um, we just have one Sunday for this. Next week, the color will be different. Why does it matter? Because God wants you to be a piece of his church wants you to understand that the people who are outside of the church are living in a world of evil spirits. They see a lot of sickness and wrong and evil. 
A church means a group, but apart from the Holy Spirit, I'm alone. I'm alone and angry and getting more angry all the time. But there is this beautiful thing called the church. And it's wrong and it's the devil's goal that I would think of myself and God in a box without my neighbor in that picture. The true biblical picture of God's church is God, me, and my neighbor, and we're all in this box. I believe that this church has a treasure. It's forgiveness for my sin. My sin goes on to Jesus. His goodness, merit, obedience, perfection, righteousness is put on me. We're baked into a cake together, Martin Luther said. Isn't that beautiful? We're baked into a cake together. Those who know that their sin is on Christ don't go to pieces when our bodies do. We say, I believe in the resurrection of the body and a life after this one, which in so many ways, as good as life is, in many ways it gets spoiled, doesn't it? In many ways there's something to spoil it. But every time you say the creed, I want you to think there's a flyover happening on those last three lines of the creed. The divisions fall away where Jesus pours out his spirit. Amen.